Well, hello and welcome to I Love Gay Today. Now, this is a special, this is a special episode. How many of you remember back in 1992, MTV comes along and launches this show called The Real World before reality TV even existed. And so we are, we have the pleasure here of today. We are here with Norman Corpy. How are you, Norman? Hey, Matt. I'm doing awesome. Thank Norman so was part of the- Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's amazing to have you here. Norman was, uh, what it was- on that original cast, if you remember, from 1992. And uh, and you had, I mean, that was like a major part of your life, obviously, but that was also, you even came out on that on, in that first season. You know, we had to move the kids forward. You know, there was opportunity there back in 92. And there just was like, we just need someone like Norm on television, something, you know, kind of shake things up a little bit, you know, just in a subtle way, but just <laughs> enough to go like, what did I just hear? <laughs> but the gay so then person you, running loose. <laughs> but then you fast forward to today, and you guys, you're back on, you're back on TV, the Real World Homecoming on Paramount Plus, and um, and uh, I just watched it. I watched the first episode, and uh, I love it. Oh my, yeah, it's it, it's it's something, you know. And we've done a couple reunion shows in the past, but this time with like the Paramount Plus doing this Homecoming version, um, even I was surprised. I didn't. I thought it would be like. You know, you know, you go and you hawk your products and you say, this is what I've done. And, you know, usually those things get really tired. I'm like, this is an entirely new series. In fact, it's more engaging almost than the actual original series in a way, because with the COVID and then the shock that we came back to the same loft that we shot the show in, you know, I'm like, the whole head trip, you know, went backwards. And then so many conversations that weren't filled having a much more adult perspective of like traveling through life and seeing things and saying, wow, um, it, it really becomes an entirely new series. There's like six new episodes and they're juicy. I mean, they're really new episodes, you know, it's just like, it's, you know, it's like it's version 2.0, I guess you could say <laughs> the kids are saying 2.0. I got that sense from it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep watching it. My husband, my husband was, was a little younger than me, and he grew, uh, he grew up, and Real World was just very much a part of his life as he was uh, uh, that all the '90s. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, so, but you know, it's interesting too because even after that, I was because I was gonna, you know, because you were an artist first. Your art was a big part of your uh, life. I know on the sh on the show when you uh, were first on. But then um, over the years, it was interesting as we were chatting and because uh, I know when we were running GayWire.com, we had uh, featured not only just you and the work you're doing, yeah. but also it's interesting. You reminded me of something that I had forgotten about, which is uh, gay entertainment television. I mean, that was like that was like a big pioneering thing you guys had done back then. It was I mean, it was absolutely groundbreaking. And a lot of people don't know, but, you know, people that lived like in Manhattan and a few other um, cities like Los Angeles, where we, we were able to buy up time. Uh, we had four different, you know, programs going on. We had our party talk show that really covered Los Angeles, the entertainment and the arts, you know, area. And it was very like entertainment tonight for the gays. And we promoted a lot of people that you would see like Leah Delaria, who's a comedian who is now like celebrated on Orange is the New Black and Jenny Livingston and, and the entire like, you know, we give a voice for people like Lady Bunny and, and Wigstock. We helped produce their movie. You know, we helped, you know, a lot of the programming and the people that went on to work with World of Wonder to bring that entire, you know, um, production company together. And we, you know, it, it's it's fond. I mean, it was really generous of MTV in the new series on the Paramount Plus and, and I think episode four or something, they actually go and we, we see some of the earlier clips of me on that programming after I did, the, you know, the real world. But, you know, after the show, there, was, there wasn't anything. No one was lining up. There wasn't any agent saying, oh, here's Norm, let's have the gay guy who's going to, you know, no, it, I was still plutonium back then. And people don't realize that they would hang the phone up, you know, uh, you know, I'd do a commercial and they go like, oh, we're canceling that commercial. And so you had to kind of create that universe. And it kind of, I kind of brought whatever I had in my treasure chest to all of these creative people. And look, I mean, it, we're, you know, we knew that the whole gay was a zeitgeist. We're such part of entertainment. You know, you can't have entertainment without some gay behind the scenes somewhere going loose. I mean, come on. <laughs> but it's all an evolution. And that's the fascinating yeah. part. And that's what you've been a part of that evolution. So when we're watching RuPaul's Drag Race on uh, uh, or any of these, it all it all stems from so many of the things that you were involved with back then. And I think maybe some folks don't even realize the, the extent of that. <laughs> I love it. And also you even cross paths with, with TLA video as well. Yes. 
Yes. You know, TLA purchased my wedding video, yeah. um, which was the film that I had produced because A, you know, I wasn't getting anybody giving me role. I had this insane amount of fame and this weird stuff and I couldn't quite now put everything in the box for me, you know. Um, you know, galleries were like, oh, you're, you know, you know, TV and art, nah, you know, that, that higher echelon. I'm like, you know what? I was working with the Andy Warhol people, you know, I know, forget it. You guys are all talking something different, but yes, um, TLA um, spotted our crazy gay wedding film and uh, was able to handle it for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, we were out there at the Philadelphia Film Festival, which we won. Hello. Okay. And it was exciting because we were up that year, Hedwig and the Angry Inch was out. Okay. So our film was running loose next to them. Yeah. And it was it was just really kind of interesting because we would be the kind of the crowd favorite because, you know, people would recognize us. And they really thought it was like, and it's, it's a very spinal tap um, yeah. thing, you know, because it's like this it looks like a real gay wedding, you know, that falls apart and people really think it's real because all the cast members are from the different real worlds. And so it, it confuses the heck out of everybody, but everything was incredibly skip, scripted and nutty and, and, and super silly. And, and it gave you that window even prior to, um, you know, uh, gay weddings that are now possible was... I was looking at things in the late nineties saying, you know, what, where is the, where's the problem in the gay community that we can use humor that could elevate this problem. And once people realized my rights aren't the same as yours, like I can't marry somebody. So in the movie, I actually try to marry somebody from Canada just to point, to exaggerate the point of the, of what people had, because people like, you know, we all have the same rights. What are you talking about? Kind of, garbage that was being spewed and i'm like no you know you could go marry someone from canada and they would get a citizenship me no that, that would not happen you know that's why these these things are important for us to have people are like you you need to have a civil union you need to have all this other kind of crap i'm like no you know we need to have constitution you know we have to need the same rights as everybody else and we have to run around and beg for everybody but so that was also part of the subliminal message was to put everybody through this comedy experience to realize and it was really aimed at a straight gay friendly audience to expand our allies by saying, wow, you know, I just had the funniest fun time, but this isn't so funny. You know, these people really don't have these things. So that was kind of a big thing. And it was really great to be a part with the, the TLA. I actually yeah. just got it back. They changed all the, the stuff and they didn't know what they had. Yeah. And there wasn't an internet really at the time. So you couldn't yeah. do digital. So they those rights were never in the contract. And so they had my movie for about 18 years and about two years ago, the new people at the TLA, you know, it was released and I'm like, oh my gosh, do you know what you have? Yeah. Because it really, no one could take the film out to um, distribute it. Cause it was, it was, it was a video, like a, like a, we made it very spinal tap, like a wedding video and the money to make it go onto film. And that's, the, was the only way you could do it because there was no digital projections. In fact, when we went to Sundance with the film, we had to take four digital projectors with us because they didn't even have digital projectors. You know, it was like us and Blair Witch and, you know, a couple of things. Yeah. And so there was, the distribution was really small. So most people have not seen this little gem. Yeah. And Heather B is hysterical. You'll have a whole <laughs> new definition of shrimp when you see Heather B. And it's a small little world because I love those folks, both at the Philly Film Festival, TLA, and how they all team up, work so close together. And you've uh, you partnered with some really good folks out there. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But what do you, uh, you're in Michigan now. And so what's, what's life like now? Michigan, the upper <laughs> peninsula of Michigan. We're in the, we're Michigan's better half, the upper half. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it was, it's always been a plan in my mind to like kind of move back this way uh, um, out of the, um, the busy life of LA. I always thought I was going to have the, the busy life and set myself up as an artist and then be back here. I've never really left it because I've always had property here, you know? And I would come up here to kind of like pull myself back together, work on my art, do stuff in a small environment. It's super isolated. There's moose and bears and all kinds of stuff running loose here. Uh, it's beautiful right off of Lake Superior. We've got little tiny little mountains running loose and waterfalls. So it's a great place to kind of get away. Also, 
it's so small that we just don't even have cell service really you know so you people just can't get you it's really frustrating when you watch them with texts and like the internet so you're in this still weird little bubble like you know lost or something on island but um it, it you know it, la just fell apart which was really hard for me and you, you, you kind of see on the show it, my entire life horizon was advanced by about 10 years you know just kind of like not getting work the savings that I had, you know, and it's, so, you know, you, it's so expensive to live in these big cities yeah. and, you, you know, you're watching the rent just being eaten away, eaten away. And then you're, you know, and then all of a sudden nine months comes down the road and you're like, oh my, I'm not going to really have much left here. This is like ridiculous. And you, and you don't want to be, you're like a frog in the, in the water. You don't want to jump out of the pot and yet it's boiling all around you. And then I'm like, okay, I, I have two months. I'm not going to even have enough money to even have gas to even drive across the country. So I got to make some, got to make some decisions here, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, you, and, but you have a bakery there. Yes. Yes, my cousins, my cousins, it's going to be their 50th anniversary of owning this bakery. And, and it's been in the family longer than that. Um, and so I have a lot of cousins. I'm Sicilian on one side of my family. So the Italian side of my family has always been the business of little operators in this town. Um, and they're kind of getting up there older. And, and if you don't really have a job in this part of the world, it's really hard to be here. You know, it's like Alaska, you know, it's like, there's not an industry that really can support a lot of people here, you know, and of the jobs, they're very far and few between. So that that's, that's why I was always like, I need to paint and get, find a way to get money or do something from a far distance and bring it in. But, you know, as my um, aunt and uncle are getting a little older and my, you know, they just need an incredible amount of help. And so it, it was a perfect little window to kind of come in um, and start of work. And I just, I, I love it because, you know, we get a lot of snow here in the upper peninsula of Michigan and it's a great place to work in the winter because you're there all day. You don't have to worry about, oh, I'm freezing and cold because the ovens are going. Everything smells amazing. You know, we're, it's around the clock bakeries, you know, yep. you know what a bakery is. It's just so, um, yeah, it's, it was a really fortunate like bubble for me to fall into. Yeah. Are you still pursuing your art? Well, <laughs> yes. You know, well, if you if you get caught up to episode four on the homecoming, um, you'll see. And I almost didn't do this, but um my housemates and we were in COVID. So we pretty much did get a chance to get outside and I didn't really want to go because I didn't want to bring COVID back, you know, cause this was, we shot this just a few months ago and it was pretty heavy duty in New York. So I'm like, Oh no, there's no cases yet recorded in this County, Michigan. And they'll know exactly where it came from. And you know, there'll be, there'll be pitchforks and shovels and hose at my door, but they got me to paint on camera. And I thought at first it'd be kind of really cheesy, it was, I'm telling you, Matt, it was like the best thing ever. And so one of the rabbits like right there. So yeah. I do this series of these chocolate rabbits. Should I bring it closer? Yeah. 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 So, um, oh, by the way, welcome to my bedroom. <laughs> um, so yeah. So last year, um, uh, as I was running out of money pretty fast, um, that, I finally got to go to the stores in Los Angeles. Not only did they wipe out all the toilet paper, but they wiped out basically food that you needed to survive, like milk and eggs and butter and flour and everything. So yeah. all that was left were, and it was coming up on Easter because it was about this time, you know, in March. And all that was left were like aisles of chocolate rabbits and ice cream. And yeah. I'm like, because by the time they allowed certain, they would allow different people and you couldn't go to the grocery store and this, you were in a group. It was like, you know, very different country. So I ended up buying all these rabbits and started doing portraits of the chocolate rabbits. <laughs> and um, and I this is like a signature thing on a particular series of art that I'm doing, like recycled paper. Oh, and I like to look for like, you know, shopping and American icons. And, and it wasn't really about, you know, so much about Easter as, as it is an unusual icon that you would find in America. Like, you know, there's so many questions like, what the fuck are you all doing with these rabbits and eating them chocolate? Like, we're all, you know, there's a mystery of, you know, all that. But um, oh. so I would have in my Zoom, you know, yeah. when the Zoom came on, I would have them behind me yeah. to try to sell them. So, because I would get party and all my friends and chatting and they're like, what, who's doing this? What are you doing? I'm like, oh, Norm. Um, they're, uh, my rabbits are for sale and that's how I was kind of like making money. And I told the story while I was on the show yeah. and sure enough, I end up painting and then it gets into like the sob story of me and losing stuff and coming back here to Michigan and all that good stuff. Yeah. And the last week and a half 
since that show aired. Um, you know, I figured I'm going to, you know, could probably have to uh, arm knuckle a couple of my friends to buy some of them. And Kevin and, and Heather are like, no, we're going to promote you on our social media. And they've had great success with their social media. I'd like, I had at the point like 900 people. So it's kind of tripled, you know, um, yeah. and people came and I have literally sold, I sold out. I said, I'm only going to do like 67 because I was born in 1967 and it gets to be a little to individually paint them all and then get them to people in a timely manner. And so I said, and I figured I would just be painting them and putting them up on my website and promoting weekly. Matt, no, I mean, I have a backup list of people, That's of, you know, and yeah. it's amazing. I'm so, and they're writing really heartfelt letters and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm trying to respond to people, but yet I need to paint. And then the, the story. Yeah. So yeah. I just can't believe it because now this is like a perfect thing. And it really, open the door and I you know I, I have a really great friend of mine um Joseph who made a, our contact and he's a great social media guy um out there Joseph Frederico so I don't know if you have any links to him but he yeah. helped me I, I'm like an idiot with my social stuff he really helps me out on all this stuff I don't get it um he reached out and I, and and it's really because he put all this together and created a stream to get these people to me within yeah. this moment to help yeah. me up and yeah. do something online highly recommend this guy and, and, and his people you know i just yeah. it's just a godsend yeah he's the he's the one who connected us and um yeah. and uh yeah and what's interesting what's interesting is it's funny because uh every genius oh i agree and uh, every time, so every time you see that that painting of a chocolate rabbit, that's interesting because you'll always be uh, always be reminded 20, 30 years from now when you're talking to all little grandkids and you tell them, just imagine that you know April twenty twenty and everything shuts down and the only thing left of the stores that you know that you can survive on was ice cream and a chocolate rabbit and they'd be looking at you like you're crazy. I know there was. Oh, I have photos of me. <laughs> just almost giggling and laughing and, and the series i was doing before this were a series of giant trees on the paper bags that were like you know really tall they look great in houses um i did you know commissions for levi's i've sold them to celebrities and i was there were incredible trees on this painting stuff and they were a great icon and i, I haven't quite finished that because i was kind of like cut off and so i was trying to think okay what are these other items and it just smacked me in the face and um and it's so there's a lot more to it than like oh it's easter time i mean it really is evolves this particular time period when you know you have no money you lose your house you 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 can't get anything eggs but you, nothing was there in the store and for weeks yeah. so i'm like calling people I'm like well do you have can i get a three or four eggs or you know, uh, there's, I just was so not prepared and I, and, and, and I live very small in a guest house. So I just had one of these pint sized refrigerators. So it wasn't like I had a bunch of freezer space to, you know, have oh, here's some chicken and stuff, nothing. And it was just like, Oh my God, <laughs> I'm just going to survive on these rabbits and chocolate ice cream. Oh. <laughs> we'll have a lot of, we're going to have a lot of stories in the future to look back on these times, but, uh, yeah. But it was just amazing. I'm really enjoying, and uh, I am going to catch up and uh, be able to watch episodes four and five. I just have to uh, uh, wait sure, for sure. My, wait for my husband to watch it with me, so he likes to watch these things together. So we have yeah. to do it in order. So yeah. uh, so we're going to get there. But no, in the meantime, now just uh, I think it's incredible what you're doing, and and uh, I'm just really glad you're able to take a few moments and kind of share your story of where you're at today and what you're up to, and bring it back to that show. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know. <laughs> um, it's it's been a really incredible ride. It's been a really interesting uh, reinvention. I mean, just to kind of step back out there um, yeah. and to step out there in a much more um, upbeat way. You know, I, I really felt somewhat apologetic, and I've I, I I I've kind of always I came from a generation of apologizing. You know, for being gay and letting people go first, and you know, always going to repair people and always doing stuff. And in this season, it took me a, a t I, I went through there and I learned a lot coming out of it. So it'd be real interesting for you to see it. So you definitely come back and want to ask more questions because woo, it gets into <laughs> some heavy duty stuff. You know, like yeah. the, the, this latest episode, we start talking about how I was labeled bisexual and how that impacted me and the gay community. And they dive deep, you know, and it was, it was a really great treat that they opened up um, Stonewall and it was like the city of New York knew how important we were to, it was just so nice to have the show acknowledged by the city of New York, how important it was 
um, and what we had just done for an entire generation. And, and they went out of their way to help shoot the show this time around, you know, and, yeah. um, you know, we love all that, you know, I love gay New York, just like behind <laughs> that and Palm Springs. Cause, Oh, you know, me and Palm Springs. Were, <laughs> it's thieves over there. Oh, I love it. Yeah. We just, uh, we just interviewed recently the Stonewall Inn as well. Uh, the whole story about the gay bars, you know, struggling to survive. And that's a, it's a huge story right now. And, uh, so it's huge, you know, and I, and as I brought my castmates in there and it was great because it was a trans lives matter um, protest outside and it gets really like brought full force with the new season on the real world on episode five. Yeah. And um, we were able to go in there and, and, you know, the man behind gay entertainment television, Mr. Gay, we used to call him is Marvin Schwamm and he's since passed. And his brother, Jerry was the bartender there. Okay. from then and now so he was such an icon and you know as being a little squirrely gay back in the 80s you know i'd get to go in and hi jerry could you just slot a little extra shot over the, our way you know and, <laughs> i remember ooh. those days yeah i love it yeah well, no seriously th thanks so much for being here with us and uh i really look forward to being able to reconnect again absolutely matt it's been All a right. pleasure same here take care now all right bye-bye Feels good, so good.